Hello everyone, and welcome to Monster Mondays, episode 22. For this one, as I hinted at in the beginning of the last episode, it's going to be another haunted house one, but this one's like 28 minutes of estimated reading time, so this will be a much shorter episode for you. Which will probably be refreshing for this channel, because the last few episodes have been at least an hour, if not two and a half hours. I don't know how any one of you is going to sit through them and stay awake through them half the time. Especially if you've never even seen the first one. Oh my god. Whew. But, hey, if you got that kind of time or just want something to soothe you or keep you up at night, maybe this will do the trick. But, that being said, it's time to get it going. And no, if I gotta be honest, I don't have a drinking problem. I film three episodes at a time in the same night, so I start at like 11 at night and then I finish it at like 5 or 6 in the morning sometimes. So it'll be the same, if you see me drinking in any of these episodes, it's the same bottle of booze. Sorry to ruin the magic there, but I mean, making these hour-long specials Literally once a week it would just take too much time not to do a few pre-recorded ahead of time, especially if I've got two jobs I'm working with right now. So yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> the Diane House, Dianea House, or however they pronounce it. As promised, here are copies of the correspondence I received from Mark for the last month. For the most part, I've merely copied and pasted them from my email application. As you'll read, he requested this in hopes that you'll better understand why he did what he did. I made this site because it's the most efficient way to share Mark's emails with you. I'm not advertising this to anyone, but I think it would be wise to pass this URL along to anyone who may be able to help with the investigation. As I collect more information from various sources, I'll update this site to keep it accurate. I'll have that link at the end of the series as well. If you need to speak with me, Jenna's my number. Thank you for your patience, and again, I'm profoundly sorry, Eric. September 6th, 2004. From Condry Mark. Date, Monday, September 6th, 2004, 8.17 a.m. Subject, old friend. Eric, hey man, it's Mark from Houston. The Saturday Night Gang. Feels like a long, long time ago, doesn't it? I found your email from your website. It looks like you're in the L.A. area now. Cool. I remember telling you, you should be out there doing the California thing. You still with Connie? I'm in Dallas now. I met someone who works in my building. We've been seeing each other for two years now. Listen, the reason I'm writing to you out of the blue is that I got this newspaper article in the mail. Maybe you got one too. It's about Andrew. Do you remember Drew? Travis would pick him up and most of the time messy hair, sort of the fanboy type. I don't rem I didn't remember his last name until I got this thing. Now it's really disturbing me. Do you know what happened? Did you hear about it already? Let me know if you have some time to talk. I can call you or... You can call me if that works better. I'm going to see if I can track down Travis and Dave. A quick search didn't seem to turn up any leads, but maybe they just don't have websites. Plus, you, you still talk to either of them, let me know. Thanks, Mark. Nine eight September eighth, two thousand four from Condry Mark. Date Wednesday, September eighth, two thousand four, seven forty four AM. Subject re an old friend. Eric, thanks for the quick reply. I didn't mean to sound cryptic in my first email, I'm just 
reluctant, I guess. I hadn't really seen or thought about Andrew since he stopped showing up for the game night. And that was five years ago. It was about the time we all went our own ways, back in 1999. You moved out west, I moved up to Dallas, etc. So when I got this article in my mailbox, it caught me by surprise. And yeah, I'll transcribe the thing for you. I wasn't sure if maybe you were the one who sent it to me. I'll put it into this email at the bottom. I remember him. He was never the kid with the idea. He was the kid who agreed with yours. Slowest to get the joke, usually. Laughed the longest. That's Andrew in a nutshell, yeah. At least that's how I remember him. He got on my nerves sometimes, but damn, if he didn't love being part of the gang. He'd ask me for some poker chips on card night or borrow dice from my bag, that sort of thing. Whenever we played Tecmo Bowl on your Nintendo, he always wanted to be on my team. Which, which would have been fine if he was any good. I haven't heard from Travis or Dave in years. They fell off the radar about the same time you did. None of us made much attempt to stay in touch. It was just one of those things. That's okay, I wasn't trying to point fingers. It happens. But I was hoping you had already heard about Andrew. You'd gotten a copy of the article. I still haven't been able to get her a number or email for Travis and Dave. Maybe they know more about this than we do. Andrew usually hitched a ride with Travis most of the time, and he was on his... he was on the way home for Travis. Didn't Andrew live with his mom, like, in an apartment, and his stepdad was a real estate broker? Had the one house some way out past Highway 6. Do you remember that? Andrew was scared to death of that house. Here's an article. There's a photo of Andrew on it with what looks like his driver's license photo. Still had messy hair. Gunman shoots to kill self in, in Boise restaurant. Diners at the roadside breakfast cafe in Interstate 84. Fled to the parking lot in a panic yesterday afternoon when a man entered and began shooting patrons inside, killing two. According to the police, the couple, John and Lucy Madsen, were having lunch when 26-year-old Andrew Hughes entered, wielding a Smith & Wesson 59 pistol. Witnesses claim the perpetrator was muttering to himself as he approached the smoking section and opened fire into the first occupied booth, fatally wounding the Madsons. Soon after, he turned the weapon on himself. All three were taken by paramedics to St. Alphonsus Regional Medical Center, where John Madsen and the shooter were pronounced dead. Lucy Madsen, 37, remained in critical condition for several hours but did not survive the night. Police are investigating Hughes's work and, and personal background, but, is, but this morning a motive for the attack is unknown. If there's more to the article, I didn't get it. That's where it was torn off. The other side is part of a Dillard's ad. This is really bothering me, Eric. What the hell was Drew doing on Boise with a fucking gun? He hung out with us for almost two years. I just don't get it. And something else is eating at me. I can't figure it out yet. Mark... September 9th, 2004, from Condry Mark. Date, Thursday, September 9th, 2004, 2 p.m. Subject to Andrew. Hey, I know how you feel. It's hard not to think of the times he sat with us at the table, smiling like a fool, rolling dice and moving his pieces around the board. He loved Monopoly Night. Always wagged his tongue when he counted the money. I don't think he realized he did that. It's impossible to think of him shooting up a diner. There's no return address in the envelope. No, but the postmark is Idaho, not California or Texas. I'm not sure if, you, if you've if you already considered this, but it's possible. The whole thing is fake. Some sick practical joke made to mess with your head. You can get newspaper... Newsprint paper for... Yeah, I've considered it. I didn't tell you this earlier, but I called up St. Alphonsus and asked if they'd... A patient named Andrew Hughes admitted last month. They had no record of him, and I wondered if it would show if he'd been pronounced DOA, and I got transferred to the ER, where they keep paramedic records and info on all DOAs. They have them listed. Speaking of which, I should probably consider that, since there's a home front theme going on at PawCon this year. I should probably get some fake newspaper print and make up some interesting headlines. 
Those could definitely be sellable, I think. <laughs> he showed up on August 28th, died of a gunshot wound to the head, pronounced dead by ER resident at 3.14 p.m. I asked for some contact info, like a phone or address where he might have been living. I got brushed off, told to call the police for that stuff. The hospital wouldn't give out any personal info, not without signatures. I hadn't reached the police yet, that's probably the next step. Glad to hear that you and Connie are going strong. Sorry to dump all of this on you. I just didn't know who else would care to listen. I'll write if anything else comes of this. At this point, I think maybe Drew's mom sent it to me. Maybe Drew kept track of me when I moved to Dallas and had my address. I listed in the book that would explain the logistics part. I'm overthinking things. Take care, Mark. September 10th, 2004, from Condry Mark. Date, Friday, September 10th, 2004. 3.11 a.m. Subject, thoughts and concerns. Hey again, I know it's late or early, depending on how you look at it, but this Andrew thing won't go away. I finally realized what's eating at me, I need to, and I need to spit it out. Do you remember what went on before Andrew stopped showing up for game nights at your place? I do. He was gone for two weeks because he had to house sit for his stepfather. Mom and stepdad went on a big vacation every summer for like ten days, and Andrew was just expected to stay behind. He usually just stayed at his mom's apartment, but that year he was asked to mind that house that his stepdad owned. It was it was one out in that old affluent subdivision west of Houston. Maybe that guy had a bunch of places. He was big on real estate, wasn't he? The guy had inherited this dog from one of his clients. Someone moved out and didn't want to take the dog with him. I want to say it was an Australian Shepherd. Do you remember any of this? Andrew talked about it the weekend before. The dog had behavioral problems, whined, barked, and scratched at the door, pissed on the carpet, didn't want to be inside, always wanted to be outside. Dad kept it on a, in a kennel, except when it rained. Andrew was supposed to take care of the dog, plus a few other things like mow the lawn and that sort of crap. But Andrew didn't want to go. Dave got into, the, into that argument with him about how it was the perfect setup for a young bachelor house all to yourself. Party time, risky business. Andrew kept saying it was all too cold there for a party. Too cold. I distinctly remember that and how he kept asking us to drive out and stay with him while he was house-sitting. I don't think anyone went out there, did they? I never did. We didn't see him for two Saturdays in a row, then Travis picked him up like usual since he was back at his mom's place. There was one night with Andrew I remember the most. I bet it's the same with you. It was the most bizarre, frustrating night I had with the group. Andrew walked in quoting some commercial verbatim. I want to say it was a Tide ad. Travis told us it was like that in the car all the way over. Commercials, shows, movies, radio songs. The first couple hours of gaming was like being in the room with the TV on. He started par Then he started parroting us. He just copies something we said. You remember? Tell me you remember this. I can see it in my head so clearly. Oh, and what was his response to anyone's complaints? Okay, Drew, stop quoting Law & Order episodes. Please give the Pontiac commercials arrest. Dude, shut the fuck up and roll your dice. Okay. And then he'd launch into something else a few minutes later. It wasn't just that he would regurgitate that crap. It was that he would take it so far. Whole reams of dialogue that he'd somehow memorized from one throwaway TV episode. Lyrics to entire songs that went from odd to funny to disturbing in the first hour. Funny enough, when people say certain words, I'll sometimes be tempted to sing a song that, that it reminds me of somehow. That has only escalated more when I have a few of... when I've had a couple of these, maybe. Look, I'll come out and say whatever happened in... In those ten days caused changes. Andrew wasn't the same person after that. We all know this. We never talked about it. At least not with me around. But fuck if we didn't know instantly that the person who came back from that house was not Andrew. I wrote before that I hadn't thought about Andrew since 99. That was a lie. You know the way your brain sometimes reminds you of things you hate to dig up? The ones that sour your stomach? I've thought about him a few times about that night. Was that the start of his madness, or whatever it was that drove him to shoot up a diner? Were we there to see him first lose his grip? Jesus, Eric, why the hell didn't we say anything? From Conjury Mark, date Friday, September 10th, 2004. 
11.38 a.m. Subject, the door is open. Eric, I woke up to the phone ringing this morning. It turned out to be the reporter from the Idaho Statesman. She finally called me back. Did I tell you I called to track down the source for the article? She didn't have any new developments on the story, but would continue to follow up with the police. Asked if she had any other details about the crime, stuff that didn't find its way to the article, and we sort of went over our notes. Most of it I already knew, but there was one piece of info that caught my attention. She wrote in the article that Andrew was mumbling or muttering to himself when he entered the restaurant, but she didn't put it, put in what he was saying. According to witnesses, he kept repeating, the door is open. Does that make any sense to you? Is the door open? Write me back, Mark. September 12th, 2004, from Condry Mark. Date, Sunday, September 12th, 2004. 5.10 p.m. Subject, a plan. Eric, I haven't heard from you. Just writing to let you know. I've, I've had a day to put some distance from this whole thing, and I've made a decision. I'll drive up down to Houston and see if I can find someone in Andrew's family. I once rode with Travis to pick Drew up, and I, I think I know where his mom used to live. From there, we, maybe we could find his stepdad in the house. I've already tried the Boise lead already. I called the, the cops and got more questions than answers, and now some Lieuten Lieutenant Perez plans to call me back if he needs more testimony from me. Like I know anything. Apparently, Andrew was living alone in a rental up there, working at a blockbuster video. That's about all I got from the cops in Idaho. So I'm aiming for Houston. Even driving my own car in a cheap motel, it's still going to cost me about $200 for the trip. Jenny is worried about me. She'd prefer I stay and pretend the police will figure this out independently. But I have to go down there, Eric. Here's why. I think Andrew was afraid of the house for a reason. Whatever that reason was, during these ten nights, something had emptied him. It gutted Andrew like a fish. It yanked out whatever he, he was inside, or shocked him into forgetting it all away. He was hollowed out. To fill in the void, he absorbed any input he could find. Television, radio, conversation soaked it up and presented it as Andrew. He could walk and talk and he wasn't injured, not physically, but he wasn't the same either. There's a gap I need to fill in my head, like that time in that house. I have these pieces of Andrew that don't match. I need something to match. Hell, I'll feel better if something inside... if something will just make sense. I won't ask you to fly down and join me, but I could use your help all the same. I have some questions you won't be able to answer. Please call or send me a note if you know any of these. My phone is... Removed by Eric. What was the stepfather's name, first or last? What was his mom's name? What was her last name? Also Hughes? What was the name of the subdivision where the stepdad's house was? I think Andrew mentioned it. I hope I haven't freaked you out too much with my crazy talk. I know it probably comes off as sounding absurd, some of it, or maybe not. You were there for some of this. If you really think I'm off my noggin, tell me. By all means, tell me. Hope to hear from you soon, Mark. September 13th, 2004, from Condre Mark. Date, Monday, September 13th, 2004, 8.22 a.m. Subject, reply, a plan. Eric, thanks again for calling. I got your email as well, and it mentions a few things we didn't discuss over the phone, so I wanted to add a comment or two. What I remember was what Travis told us, that time he went to pick up Drew and had to get go to, up to his room to get him. That was the last time gamed with us. Travis went upstairs to his room, and the kid was pacing back and forth by his bed. Everything was neat and tucked in, but the carpet was worn in a line where Drew was walking. Like, it's all he did. Yes, I remember this too. And the way Travis told the story, like he wanted it to sound funny, but he didn't believe it was. And Dave laughed and he said, man, that dude's a broken record, and we all agreed, nodding and chuckling. Fuck, we all just let it go at that. Like it was easier to write him off, but Travis was the last one to laugh. He'd seen the room with his own eyes. Go, I really would, but Connie got sick last night and she's still throwing up this morning and I don't feel right leaving town with her like this. Understandable, you stay there, I'll continue to email you on this thing. I can't really talk about Drew with Jenny, she never knew him. She doesn't get why this is so dis disturbing outside of the horror that took place in Boise. That's why I keep writing to you, nobody else gets it. Hey, maybe I'll somehow find Travis or Dave when I'm in town. M. 9-14-2004, from Condre Mark. Date, Tuesday, September 14th, 2004, 6.51 p.m. 
Subject, I made it. E. Made it to Houston. The drive was hell. Traffic and a persistent rattle in the trunk wore me down. The AC unit in my motel room sounds like a submerged Cessna engine. It'll be hard for me to sleep with it on and impossible with it off. Well, at least the whole internet access bit works and I can check my email. Tomorrow's a long day. I'll be prowling Bracewood in your old neighborhood to zero in an apartment complex I went to once. Joy, wish me luck. Mark. 9-15-2004 from Condry, Mark. Date, Wednesday, September 15th, 2004, 9.06 p.m. Subject, lots of stuff. Eric. Great news, I have a solid lead. The whole day felt like I was pulling a string from the sand. But it's pointed me in the right direction. These emails are becoming more of a journal for me than to help log the, my progress. I hope you don't mind. It took me an hour of driving back and forth between... Gessner in the Bracewood area before I zeroed in on the right side street. The landmarks had changed. I was I was 90% sure I'd found the right apartment complex, but I was still grasping air. With no name for Drew's mom and no guarantee her, her last was Hughes, I went to the manager's office and just got lucky. Her name is Nancy Hughes and she stopped paying rent and September of 1999. Drew paid it for the rest of the lease term, which ended the following February, according to the note in the resident file. He settled in cash. Seems mom moved out or just up and left one day. Poof. Andrew was living alone in the apartment then. How was he paying for rent with just a minimum wage job? I showed the manager the article about Andrew, and then I lied. I said I was a private investigator. I don't know why. Maybe just to justify why I was having her dig up rental information from five years ago. Anyway, she got off on it and kept rooting around in the Hughes file for me like a movie sidekick. She found something. A third-party check covered the rent for December of 98. Kurt Malone. I think his this is his stepdad. The manager photocopied the bill for me, and ten minutes later I got the phone number printed with Kurt's address in the upper left-hand corner. No luck there. Disconnected. So I took another approach and called 411 for a local realtor service. You can search for contact for information for a specific re realtor. I remember hearing about this from a co-worker who had sold his place in Greatwood. Mal Malone was listed under a little Remax affiliate office in Katy. I got that number and called there, left a message. Evelyn, the owner, called me back and said Malone hadn't worked there in forever. He up and vanished, left with her all kinds of issues. She thinks he had financial problems and bailed for Mexico. I find it hard to swallow a theory told me in a strange, in a stage whisper. But that was just her personality. Still, that's two people going. Before I thought maybe mom just moved in with stepdad. Now I don't know what the hell to think. The call went on for half an hour as I heard the HR nightmare Evelyn went through thanks to Kurt's disappearance. Halting his benefits, freezing the 401k plan, surrendering documents to the police, etc. I finally broke in and asked about the house, the one out in West Houston he owned. She got reticent after that. It took me another ten minutes to answer the, her questions about who I was. This time I was honest and upfront with her. I guess it paid off because she believed me, or at least believed my intentions. And she checked her records. I have an address, Eric. Kurt had his own home in Sugarland, but get this, he was renting a house from a client way out west near Pecan Grove Plantation. Since he was supposed to be selling the place, the paperwork was curious, but the previous owners had signed off in multiple areas, like no actual conflict of interest. She didn't know what happened to the house after it was seized by the bank. I guess I'll find out tomorrow when I drive out there. I'm close, man. I'm real close. September 16th, 2004. Now, Mark was able to send text messages from his phone, but I frequently received them late, sometimes hours after he sent them as is the case since the September 21st messages from removed debt messaging sprintpcs.com date Thursday September 16th 2004 3:33 p.m. subject no subject where are you call me from Condre Mark date Thursday September 16th 2004 8:25 p.m. subject the house holy fuck i just tried calling you five times today but i got your machine i really need to talk call me as soon as you can 
Where do I start? The house is still there. It's the only generic one-story thing. Bricks and sliding and siding. It must have been built simultaneously with the other homes in the neighborhood, but it just looks older. The roof is scarred in places. The driveway hasn't held up like the others have. Cracks in the pavement. A plank is missing from the side gate. I rang the doorbell and figured I'd just talk to the new owners. No one answered. I couldn't really hear if it worked or not. Blinds and curtains in the windows kept me from peering inside. There was a dusty pickup truck with a warped front fender parked in the driveway. A neighbor across the street saw me checking it out. He talked to me for a while as he watered his shrubs. He hasn't met the person who lives in this house now, or if anyone is living there, really. He remembered Kurt not by name, but as a guy who stayed there for a few months. The previous owners, Kurt's clients, didn't live there much longer. They, all had, they had all sorts of problems with the house. Electrical, heating, that sort of thing. They moved out, left most of their furniture behind. He said, packed into a big RV one day and just drove off. He still remembered their names, John and Lucy Madsen. 9-18-2004 from Condry Mark. Date Saturday, September 18th, 2004, 9.15, sorry, 7.59 a.m. Subject re-update. Hey, Eric, we're playing phone tag. When you called, I was already on the plane. When I called back, I guess you were at the hospital again. Really sorry to hear about Connie. Any idea what it is yet? Food poisoning? Something else? What are the doctors saying? I'm in Boise now. Yeah, I nabbed a ticket on short notice. Got on standby. I left my car in the garage in George Bush Airport in Houston. Jen freaked out when I told her, then she got very terse and said I should do what would make me happy and hung up. What will make me happy? Christ. I don't know a soul in Idaho. I haven't slept in two days. I'm charging everything to my visa and I have no idea how I'm going to pay it off. My watch stopped working yesterday. I got this weird ringing in my right ear. It comes and goes. Knowing as hell, I'll tell you what, what would make me happy. Closing my eyes and not seeing Andrew staring back at me. What are you going to do once you get there? Do you plan on telling the police the Madison connection? Do you think Madison's left something in that house and drove... That drove Drew nuts and... And he killed them four years later? Seriously, this is fucked up. Yeah, I don't know what to think. Right now it's just a connection. The Madsons lived in the same house. The Madsons were there four and a half months. Drew was there for ten days. I have no idea what it means. I'll email you when I figure something out. I feel like I should just pass this along to some people. Like to get you some help out there or to bring the feds or something. I don't know anyone else if anyone else has managed to make the connection you did. And it's an important one to the case. Can I forward your emails and contact info to someone? I've been thinking about that because I would... I would ask you to do that for me for, at first. But now, I don't think I'll get the kind of help I need. Let's face it, there are enough unexplainable pieces of this thing... I'm going to get two types of interest, nuts and skeptics. I wouldn't mind so much the skeptic, except I get this vision in my head of some guy calling Jenny, calling my parents, calling my boss at work, looking to paint the picture of a guy who's lost his mind after hearing that his dead friend went nuts. I haven't been candid with Jenny or my supervisor at the office because this isn't something you can easily explain. I've been calling in sick to work. I told Jen I had to go to Boise to attend a pseudo-wake. I don't want that to bite me in the ass while I'm looking into Andrew's past. Here's what you can do for me, though. You can hold on to this stuff as evidence or whatever. If something crazy happens and I'm in trouble, use this to explain the situation to me. Forward emails to my friends or family. Maybe if they can read them, they'll understand what I'm going through. I know you didn't mean to inherit this job. I'm sorry to make you do it, but I really appreciate the help. Mark in Potato Land. <laughs> okay. September 20th, 2004, from Country Mark. Date, Monday, September 20th, 2004, 10.13 a.m. Subject, new lead. I called the hospital where Andrew was taken back in August and asked some pointed questions about where Andrew's body went. Who picked it up? Did a relative or friend show up? The answer was no. He tagged it with John and Lucy, and I kept demanding some sort of lead. So the intern gave me the names of relatives who were, who, who were called in to confirm... Madsen's idea arranged for the funeral home delivery. John's cousin lives out here. I'm about to head out and meet Greg Archer, the cousin and his wife. I'll write again from the hotel, M. From Condry Mark, Monday, September 20th, 2004, 10.40pm. Subject, the Archers. 
back. That was strange. I met the archers. I know what you said the last time I called. I need to stop lying because it'll make it harder on me later. But I wasn't about to tell them I'm a good friend of the guy who killed Greg's husband or cousin. I said I knew the Madsons back when they were in Houston. I had some burning questions about what happened to them as I claimed they practically dropped off the map when they left town. I hadn't heard from them since. Greg did most of the talking in that stiff smile way. His wife Helen was pleasant. She found ways to interrupt my chat with Greg and remind him of the other things he needed to get done. The more she did, the more I encouraged Greg to keep chatting. The Madsons, as he tells it, had a long future planned in Houston. John got a transfer to Schlumberger Oil and looked forward to settling down. Then things started to go wrong after they moved in. Just little things that piled up. Their car kept getting flat tires. Lucy broke her ring finger while footsing with the dishwasher. Trouble getting mail. Their phone disconnected when they didn't pay the bill for two months. A bill they never got. That sort of thing. Finally something happened. Greg doesn't know what. It was enough to get them to put at the house on the market. That same week, John sold his company stock, gutted his 401k, quit his job, and put everything into a big RV. He and Lucy drove off in their new motorhome and never looked back. They've been driving around the country the last five years nomadic. Lucy got pregnant in 2002 but miscarried. They still kept on the road. Greg thinks they would have just kept driving through Idaho if their RV hadn't broken down with an AC problem. Greg says John called him up out of the blue and asked if, Lucy, if he and Lucy could stay over. Greg made the guest room upstairs and he and Helen welcomed them to their house for a week. It was right before the shooting. Here's where it gets stranger. Greg took me up to the guest room and pointed to some spots on the carpet. Right in front of the closet door were furniture footprints, like something had stood there. Greg said it was the dresser, the one against the opposite wall. They barricaded the closet door for the duration of their stay. It was the strangest thing. He also noticed they kept the bedroom light on around the clock and bundled up with a spare set of woolen blankets for the bed. Greg never found the right way to ask several questions. I think he felt a little better talking to me about it. I'm not his cousin, but I'm someone that listened to him and agreed it was bizarre. I left Greg and Helen's not feeling any better. I felt worse now. I ache the way you're sore right before you get really sick. I'm trying to put things together. I really am. I have to go to the police now, don't I? I'll go first thing in the morning, I promise, Eric. 9-21, 2000, September 21st, 2004, from Condry Mark. Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 2-21 a.m. Subject, no subject. Hey, I just saw this thing on the Discovery Channel, probably a rerun. I bet you can catch it sometime. All about natural predators and stuff. Wild things. Yeah, I'm watching TV since I can't sleep. Anyway, they had this thing out on the Venus flytrap talking about how it lures the curious insect into its lip and then these invisible hairs or something sense when one of it, the suckers lands on it and wham! It swallows the bug just like that. Later on it spits out the skeleton of the fly and waits for its next victim. Some types of fly traps emit this odor to entice more food, says the voice on TV. The fancy name for them is Dione Muscipula. So I wonder if, if that's all this is. This whole thing with the shooting and the anonymous article in the Houston and the footprints in the carpet. It's all to get me into the Venus flytrap, only the scent isn't a sweet sap. It's guilt. Guilt over all those times I was around drawing and didn't do anything, you know what I mean? And I'm flying all over the fucking country, my head is buzzing, and I think I'm getting close to the truth, but really, I'm tickling some invisible hair. The ground is about to fold up on me and swallow me down to that place where Nancy Hughes and Ken Malone went. I'm gonna take some sleeping pills, I hope Connie's going better. Man, I miss Jen, she has a way of making me feel like I'm home just by being around her. I'm tired of motels, I'm sorry Eric, I'm so sorry, Em. From Condry Mark. Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 12.15pm. Subject, where Andrew stayed. Eric, bingo. I went to the police and asked to talk to Lieutenant Paris. Instead, I got Detective S Sokolov. Sounds Russian. He's, he's, he said he was working on the Hughes case now. I'm more inclined to think he was just running interference for Perez if I was a wacko. Anyway, I told him about the Madison connection with Andrew to see if that would help. He said they'd look into it, then started with the questions about me, and I looked for a way to cut the chat short. Police stations make me uncomfortable. 
The rest of the talk was rather banal, but at the end of it, I almost offhandedly he asked if I wanted to sign for Andrew's personal effects since they had copies of all the important stuff. I said sure, even though it made me feel like they've already written off this case. Drew's been busy the last four years and has, and has driver's licenses for Kansas, Colorado, Arizona, California, and Idaho. Looks like he stayed at friends' homes because none of the addresses printed on the licenses have apartment numbers. His Idaho license is just two months old and it has the address of the rental home where he stayed. I'm going to drop by this afternoon and see what happened to his things there. Maybe there's a clue on to how he knew where to find the Madsons or why he shot them. I'm certain Perez or someone has done this already, but I'm not sure he looked very far. Wish me luck, Mark. From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.14 p.m. Subject, no subject. Standing in front of the house now. It's the same one, the Houston house. Same marks on the roof, same fence damage from removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.22 p.m. Subject, no subject. Just talked to an old man across the street. He says the house has been here for years, rented out as far back as he can remember. It's in all caps, so I'm speaking a little louder. Not, not that one can really tell since I'm having to speak over music as well. From removed at, spr at messaging.sprint.pcs.com Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.25 p.m. Subject, no subject. I rang the doorbell. No answer. It's exactly the same, Eric. I don't understand. From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.29 p.m. Subject, no subject. Ears ringing again. I don't know what I'll do. It's how is, how is it the same? From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com. Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.33 p.m. Subject, no subject. There's a way into the house here. From removed at sprintpcs.com. Removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com. Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.33 p.m. Subject, no subject. Where are you? Pick up the phone. From removed at sprint, messaging.sprintpcs.com. Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.38 p.m. Subject, no subject. I'm going inside. From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com. Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.41 p.m. Subject, no subject. Inside the house, nobody is here. The air is cold. Metal smell. From removed at sprintpcs.com. Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.41 p.m. Subject, no subject. I found stairs going up. I didn't see second story from street. From removed at sprintpcs messaging.sprintpcs.com Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004 4.47 p.m. Subject, no subject. Did you call? Signal cuts off. Three bars, then no bars. I'm looking for more of Drew's stuff here. Layout is really bizarre. Lots of rooms. From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004 4.47 p.m. Subject, no subject. Door at the end of the hall made of metal. I'm checking from the other rooms instead. From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com, date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 5.05 p.m., subject, no subject, call! From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com, date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 5.09 p.m., subject, no subject, found something, Drew's backpack, getting out of here now. Jeez, there's a lot of caps messages here so far. Thankfully, it's about to end soon. I'm, I'm wearing my voice out trying to <laughs> change it to indicate yelling. <sighs> From removed at sprint messaging dot uh, at messaging dot sprint pcs dot com. Date Tuesday, September twenty first, two thousand four, five eleven p.m. Subject no subject. I think someone here, I just heard something. 
from removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com, date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 5.77 p.m. The door is open! 9.27, September 27th, 2004, from Condry Mark, date Monday, September 27th, 2004, 1.18 p.m., subject for Thursday. Hello, Eric, this is Jennifer. I'm on Mark's PC now. I did like you suggested, and I've looked through his outbox, and I don't see any emails about this to anyone else. There aren't that many, really. He didn't tell me a lot of this stuff, Eric. Like, now I'm reading the last thing he sent you back on the 13th. I didn't know he was so emotional. Why didn't he tell me that about this? But, but anyway, like you said, he, he wrote it to you from his laptop when he was in Houston and Boise. And place up there said they'd found that in his hotel room, and they're taking their own sweet time checking out for clues. So yeah, I'll keep asking for that to be sent down. Where else should I look? I don't know what else to do here except wait until you come down and look at it. He does have an AOL Instant Messenger, but I can't tell where the chat logs would be saved or anything if he's done that. Please tell me what else I can do. You know more about what he was up to than anyone else, because because of this old friend the two of you had who went crazy, and now Mark is missing for almost a week. Please send me the other emails he sent you, please. I want to know now, Jen. October 1st, 2004, from Postmaster. Date, Friday, October 1st, 2004, 1.30 p.m. Subject, undeliverable mail. Unknown user X. RCPT2 generated the following response. 550 unknown user. Less than X at X dot X greater than symbol. Original message as follows. Greater than, greater than from x at x dot x. Greater than, greater than date, pound, date, um, colon, Friday, October 1st, 2004, 12.47 p.m. Greater than, greater than, subject, no subject, greater than, greater than, greater than, greater than, Human arm and leg bones found on street! Greater than, greater than. Scottsdale residents got a shock at the start of their morning commute when they found what seems to be human bones laying on the road on Sage Drive. Greater than, greater than. Crime scene technicians arrived with half an hour and began to sweep the scene for more evidence that might help identify this human victim, or at least establish an approximate time of death. Police spokesman Daniel Swift said bone evidence alone isn't usually enough to determine the identity or even the cause of death. These remains just don't didn't just appear on the road, they were moved here, Swift said. Therefore, we're asking any witnesses to contact the place with information that might pertain to what happened. No other evidence was found along Sage Street or in the yards of neighboring homes. More on the story as it develops. Whoever you are, whatever you are, fuck you, I may not know you, but I can tell what this is. I'm not fooled, your Venus flytrap game won't work. I'll make damn sure to warn Jenny and the others, too, so nice try, but no one's falling for your bait this time. It stops here. Updates. Although I want this to end, it's becoming painfully obvious for all of us to have closure regarding Mark's disappearance. The trail he left has raised too many unanswered questions. Since the time I first published this site for Jenny and those close to Mark, new information continues to arrive from various sources. In my last posted email, I refused to take the bait. I said it would stop here, but it doesn't stop here there. Not by any stretch, this page will chronicle my findings and other resources as I discover them. Some may have no connection to how or why Mark vanished, only time will tell. A final note for those of you like, like Sandra or Nathan Condre, the truth is I don't know yet what to believe with this whole thing, but I know what I don't want to believe. October 14th, 2004, Jen called. She spoke with the Boise police again yesterday, and they have finally agreed to ship down the laptop. When she gets it and looks at it herself, she'll send it my way. If I find anything new, I'll add it here. October 17th, 2004. Among the spam today, I received this email from someone who seems to have stumbled upon the site. From Mr. Paranoia. Subject, the house is very interesting. If it's real, I have some information for you. I don't know, Mark, but that won't matter once I send you this link. Based on what I've researched, those who have figured out what this flytrap house risks being becoming its next victim. Not everyone is eaten by it or them. Maybe. Some may just not be psychologically susceptible to it, the way some can't be hypnotized. But if you walk away knowing too much about it, the house will get to you. 
sooner or later. Witness the Madsons. Maybe you don't want to know anything else. Well, regardless of how I feel about it, this site isn't for me. So in case you read it here first, send me what you have. I'll decide later if I want to share it. Mr. Paranoia. Also, don't expect me to publish your messages to me ever again. I'm not a PR firm. <laughs> October 22nd, 2004. After trading emails several times with Mr. Paranoia, he finally sent me a link mentioned on October 17th email. Jen, I've read it already, and I want you to treat it as a hoax unless you get something in the mail from a grocery store in Arizona. Call me when you've read it and we'll talk. It's a live journal site, which means... To read it chronologically, you need to scroll to the bottom of the page and work your way up. The journal author is allegedly a 16-year-old named Daniel Stevens. Here's the link. October 26th, 2004. Jen, please call me back. I know it must be driving you crazy, but do not go to Phoenix. Mark was never there, despite what the postmark says in the box. The keys are just like that article about Andrew. Bait. Please, please don't do this. Send me the laptop and we'll figure it out together, okay? Wouldn't have to put this here if you didn't. If you'd answer your phone, I know you visit this page regularly. Call me. October twenty sixth, two thousand four. Late. Lots of responses. I didn't expect this. Thank you for your support and, and your technical notes. At this time, I cannot in involve and will not include anyone else for several reasons. Please respect my decision on this matter. I will keep the contact information for paranormal investigators, and I will continue to help those close to Mark as best I can. Please, no more phone calls. Connie is going out of her mind. Thank you. October 27th, 2004. Sundra slash Nathan. Check your email. I finally heard back from Sprint PCS service rep today. No more account authorization hassles. He said the records show and have billed for only 14 text messages. From Mark's phone on September 21st and the last one time stamped at 5.11. He's sending me a copy of the logs, but I'm not sure if they'll do us any good at this point. Awaiting sight of laptop now. 10-28-2004. I've been contacted by Diane M., who says she was friends with Lucy Madsen when she lived in Houston. Hello, Eric. A friend of mine linked me to the site asking if it was the same Lucy I knew when I lived in Sugarland. After doing some reading, I was convinced it is. I had no idea what happened after... She and John moved. Lucy and I met through a bit of a book club. Some mutual friends started up. We we're both avid readers. Yes, she and John had all sorts of unexplainable problems with that house. I remember seeing some of them firsthand, like the leak. After reading about your friend Mark, I, s I stewed a bit. Then I called up my father. I often talked with Lucy on AOL Instant Messenger when she lived there and thought maybe some of those old dialogues would be of use to you. But they wouldn't have been on my old PC, which I gave to my dad, oh, a year ago. I went over earlier tonight and dug through the program files for any sign of the AOL Instant Messenger chats with Lucy way back when. Dad had removed much of the stuff he deletes things, but I did find a scrap from February of 99. It's the one I remembered. It was the one that made me curious to visit. Now, I don't really think it's a supernatural thing. I'm more prone to think Lucy, Lucy had a set of nervous... A sort of nervous breakdown and created or imagined traumatic moments in the house. The rest of it, like your friend's experience, I can't explain, but I hope you'll find closure soon. Attachment wouldn't open, but hopefully Diane will try again. Update, I got the chat log and converted it to HTML. I don't know if Diane is still using her screen name or if Lucy's is taken by another user now. So to protect both of them from unwarranted IMs, I've removed the numbers from the ends of their necks. If there are users with the indentations in this log, they are not the same people, FYI. Here's the AIM chat log. AIM is an AWOL instant messenger. 10-29-2004. Yeah. Laptop arrived. There's a lot to sort through here, most notably some pictures Mark must have downloaded from his camera phone. But his computer wasn't equipped with Photoshop or any of their photo apps, so I don't see more than thumbnails. I'll move them through my hard drive along with the recent files and see what I can find. Also, it's crunch time at the office, so I'll be working this weekend, FYI. Maybe we could all use a little mental break from this. October 31st, ooh, Halloween, 2004. Hooray for the automated FTP uploading. If this sees publication, it means I'm still not back from my trip to the never-ending suburban grid in the valley. Consider it a precautionary update. When I return, I'll remove this link since I can't stand sounding like some sort of martyr, nor do I like to cause a panic. In the meantime, if, if it could wind up being critical, 
I've been keeping a personal blog on a remote host. Don't worry about me, Connie. I'm sure I'll have quite the story to tell. Love, E. October 4th, 2005. This is Connie. It has been nearly one year since Eric drove off and never came back. I don't know how to do HTML. I don't know if this is how Eric did things. I'll be doing good to just copy this page back onto the website. What has happened in a year? A lot. Not enough. I don't have any answers, just a million questions. Let's see, I met Jennifer and Rachel, who's Kim's girlfriend. The three of us still keep in touch. Legally, Eric and Mark Cam are considered missing. This makes some things very hard on us. What else? I have a mountain of files, emails, letters, digital photos that may or may not have anything to do with your disappearance. Every time I tried to start in, I got overwhelmed, so last week I hired someone to go through all of it for me and see if anything made sense. The reason I'm finally having, finally learning this thing is that he has found one or two pieces to this puzzle, and I feel a responsibility to continue what my husband began. This is a test post later this week after I hear back from Jenny. I'll post more information. X. October 12th, 2005. Well, for one reason or another, the new informant has yet to be verified, so until I hear back from the source, I can't post the link. Now I get how hard this is. You never know who's on the other end of a modem. Thanks for your patience. All three of you are still reading. X. October 14th, 2005. Although she just used her diary to lash out at me instead of answering me privately, I will link the live journal by a woman who claims to know about both Mark, what both Mark and Eric are investigating. Edit. Okay, I'm still figuring out the link thing. The blog of Lorian Mathers. Hoping that works. X. Credit to Eric Heiser on Reddit. And that was... The Diane House. Final thoughts? Very engaging, very intriguing, and uh, I think it, it might have actually been longer than I thought it would be in terms of reading time, but that's okay. I mean, it was about the same length as that last um, one in terms of pages, even if there was maybe less text on, on each page, so it's hard to know, but on playback we'll know if this was shorter or not. That being said, um, it very much uses the haunted house in a slightly different way than than you would think with a story like this. When I went into reading about it, I thought, hmm, is this going to be something where they explore an old haunted house after it bugs them to no end, or, you know, how's, how are they going to execute this? It turns out, you know, keeping journals, you know, web blogs, things like that, it was a very interesting way to, to go about this and text between each other. Instead of that typical, oh, you go in for a prize, or... You go in on an investigation, find out, you know, the truth about it. Here, we're kept um, in the dark about what actually it is about that place. That seems to make people disappear when they know too much. And if such a place exists, I, I certainly know there's more than a few paranormal investigators that would love to go check it out. That being said, this has been Monster Mondays, episode 22, with your host, the Forsaken Scribe. With that, I say goodnight, and remember, Mom's not here, kids. <laughs>